Between the years 1995 to 2001, a woman's significant others kept dying under mysterious circumstances. But it was only a matter of time before the authorities began to catch on to who the likely culprit was. This is the case of the Black Widow. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also using anything I can find as a back scratcher. Welp, looks like I have to use this. Today's story features a woman whose extreme narcissism and sociopathic tendencies led her to believe that she could get away with practically anything, including murder. Julia Lynn Womack Turner was born on July 13th of 1968 in Marietta, Georgia. Shortly after birth, Lynn, that was the name she went by, was adopted by a married woman named Helen Womack. Helen was a legal secretary and her and her husband raised Lynn in a quite spoiled manner, buying her all types of expensive gifts and clothes. However, when Lynn was around five years old, Helen and her husband got divorced. And so then, for a period of time, Helen raised Lynn on her own. That was until Helen was introduced to a man named D.L. Gregory. To Lynn's great dismay, Helen and D.L. eventually got married. And while Lynn was a teenager, D.L. acted as a father figure to her. However, they didn't exactly get along. Around this same time period, Lynn began to act up. She started using illegal substances, getting into trouble, and even wound up in a rehab facility for a bit. Years later, though, in her early 20s, Lynn had recovered and was then attempting to start a career in law enforcement. Soon, she became a 911 operator alongside taking a civilian position with an undercover narcotics unit in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Also, starting around this time, her friend group became a bunch of cops. Together, they all went to the club, spent time in the hot tub, and played pool. During one night out, partially spent at an Atlanta patrolman's apartment, Lynn was introduced to a Cobb County police officer by the name of Glenn Turner. The year was 1991, and right away, Lynn was infatuated with Glenn. Evidently, friends found the attraction odd, considering how different they viewed the two. With Lynn being a social climber seeking wealth and fortune, and Glenn being more of a middle-class, regular Joe type. But regardless, for the next several months, Lynn was doing all that she could to seduce Glenn. Much of this included buying him expensive gifts, all the way from tickets to NASCAR races to snakeskin cowboy boots. A strategy that, as it turned out, was quite effective. Within the span of a year, Glenn was just as enamored with Lynn as she was with him. The two of them were soon spending a lot of time together, and Glenn was preparing to propose to her. He had even already bought a ring and showed it to a friend with a plan being that he would pop the question during Christmas. Meanwhile, earlier that same year, Lynn had officially applied to become a police officer. Despite passing the physical exam quite easily, though, she failed the psychological exam. After this, Lynn's ego was shattered and she began looking for a higher paying position at the dispatch center. Ultimately, though, she was unsuccessful at this effort, and as a result, she slipped into a bit of a depression and was soon calling out of work a lot. But when Christmas rolled around and Glenn finally proposed, the two of them set their sights on marriage. Two months later, they finally had moved in together and officially established a date for the wedding. 
It was going to take place in August of 1993. Interestingly enough, by this point, Glenn had already named Lynn as a beneficiary on his life insurance policy. In fact, he had done that a considerable amount of time before he even proposed to her. And by the way, what this meant was essentially that in the case of his death, Lynn would receive a lot of his money. Anyway, there were a lot of things that Lynn was keeping secret from her soon-to-be husband. Not only did she have some serious character defects, as we'll talk about shortly, but she was in a lot of debt. Despite having a salary of around $20,000 a year, which adjusted for inflation is approximately $42,500, her monthly payments for her house and car were almost the same as the amount of money she took in monthly. Additionally, she had accumulated several financial penalties for frequently maxing out her credit card. In essence, the warning signs were there for those who chose to look. And for those who did look, such as Glenn's friends and family, they found Lynn to be untrustworthy and practically unlikable. Meanwhile, Glenn had a hard time seeing the forest through the trees for a while. And on August 21st of 1993, he and Lynn officially went through with their wedding. But even during the ceremony, there wasn't a lot of optimism about the couple's future. First, the pair were unable to light this so-called unity candle together, which is a tradition some couples do. And then, in his best man's speech, Glenn's brother, James, was quoted as saying, I feel like I'm more at a funeral than a wedding. I don't see this working out, but I hope for the best. Now, little did James or any of the attendees of the wedding realize just how profoundly ominous these words would be. In fact, it didn't take long whatsoever for Lynn and Glenn to start having marital issues. During their honeymoon, Lynn was apparently unhappy about Glenn booking them on a family cruise as opposed to a luxury cruise. Then, when they returned from this short vacation, Glenn was already complaining to friends about Lynn having difficulties performing in the bedroom. And by only six months of being unhappily married, the couple was officially sleeping in separate bedrooms. Despite all of this, Glenn initially tried pretty hard to maintain his relationship with his wife. Frequently, he called her over the phone while he was at work and asked her if she wanted him to bring her something to eat. Much of the time, however, Lynn responded to him in a very rude and dismissive manner. And so, realistically, with this complete lack of chemistry, it was only a matter of time before the relationship fell apart entirely. Before long, Lynn had completely quit her job, forcing Glenn to get a second job working at a gas station. Additionally, she continued her habit of spending exorbitant amounts of money. This time, it was on things such as a Datsun 240Z automobile and various trips out of town. Ironically, though, Lynn was the one who put Glenn on a budget, insisting that he only spend $20 a week, which, adjusted for inflation, is about $42.50 nowadays. So understandably, by early 1995, Glenn was simply tired of putting up with it. Glenn reportedly told a friend that Lynn had threatened to shoot him with his own service weapon, and that if anything happened to him, she would be the one responsible. About a week after he said this, Glenn suddenly began feeling sick with flu-like symptoms. As a result, he took a few days off of work and stayed home to rest. However, at a certain point, it got so bad, Glenn was admitted to the emergency room and given fluids. Evidently, this helped to some degree, so he was ultimately discharged and sent home. But then, upon returning home, the flu-like symptoms returned with a vengeance. During the early morning hours of March 3rd, 1993, 
Lynn claimed that Glenn woke up around midnight and started acting erratically. According to Lynn, Glenn was explicitly hallucinating and even tried to jump off the balcony because he thought he could fly. Afterwards, he then went down to the basement and attempted to drink gasoline. But with Lynn's help, he soon walked back up to his bedroom and went to sleep. The following morning, Lynn says that Glenn woke up feeling much better and she fed him jello. Next, she left the house to go run some errands, and when she returned, she found Glenn lying dead in his own bed with a blanket pulled over him. A uh, very convenient story, huh, Lynn? Anyways, a few days later, Glenn had a funeral ceremony, and many of his friends couldn't help but notice Lynn wasn't exactly acting like someone whose husband just passed away. Several people reported hearing her say, I've got to get the hell out of here multiple times. Additionally, Lynn was spotted holding hands with some new mystery man that none of them had ever seen before. As for who this was, we'll get to that in a little bit. In the meantime, Glenn's autopsy report evidently concluded that he died of an irregular heartbeat but many of his family members, including his mother Kathy, were skeptical of this. Once again, they didn't really trust Lynn as far as they could throw her. And anyone who knew Glenn knew that he was an extremely strong and robust person with no known health issues. According to his mother Kathy, he had even survived a bad motorcycle crash eight years prior that left him in a coma. Only weeks after waking up, he had returned to work. So yeah, nobody was buying this idea that he randomly died at the age of 31. But because of the massive expenses associated with it, Kathy wasn't able to afford a second, more detailed autopsy. Meanwhile though, Lynn inherited a lot of Glenn's pension money, and by the time Glenn died, she already had a new boyfriend. In fact, Unbeknownst to Glenn, she had been cheating on him with this guy for years. His name was Randy, and interestingly enough, he too was originally unaware of his counterpart's existence. Just a little background, Randy Thompson was born on June 12th of 1968 in Warner Robins, Georgia. Growing up, he was always looking out for people. According to his sister, Kimberly, one time when she as an epileptic was having a seizure on the school bus, Randy intervened so that no one could see. Randy apparently knew that his sister didn't like to be seen that way, so he made sure to hide the incident while still keeping her safe during it. Friends described Randy as a manly man who also had a soft side for those he loved. After graduating from high school and starting out as a deputy sheriff, he later became a firefighter. Around the same time as this, he got married and had a child, but ultimately the marriage didn't work out. By the time he met Lynn Turner in late 1994, he was looking for someone new. Not long after being introduced to Lynn, the couple were infatuated with each other. Evidently, Lynn used the same strategy on Randy as she did on Glenn, buying him all sorts of gifts and love bombing him. In fact, she had even paid for the two of them to go on a week-long cruise together. Meanwhile, Randy was completely unaware that Lynn was even married. But just a few days following Glenn's death, Randy and Lynn moved into an apartment together. As for who paid? Well, Lynn paid for it, with the use of some of Glenn's pension money, of course. And then, by the summer of 1995, Randy and Lynn had officially moved into an entire house, which once again was paid for with the use of Glenn's money. This time around, the receipt amounted to $150,000, which, adjusted for inflation, is about $303,000. Anyway, that same year, Lynn wound up pregnant, and on January 1996, she gave birth to the couple's first child, a daughter. Not long after, Lynn then gave birth to another child, this time a boy. Now that the pair was 
pretty established. Randy personally tried to get Lynn to marry him, but likewise, she continually refused. Nevertheless, following the birth of their second child together, Lynn had finally convinced Randy to name her as the beneficiary of his $200,000 life insurance policy. Around the same time, though, the couple began experiencing some serious issues. In January of 1997, Lynn accused Randy of punching her in the mouth and subsequently pressed charges. As a result, Randy was convicted of battery and given 10 months probation. Still, the couple remained legally married as things continued deteriorating between them. However, according to Randy's friends, Lynn had a skillful ability at getting into Randy's head. She could make him happy, sad, or irritated, and oftentimes did all three. But following her pressing charges against him, she was able to mess with him so badly that on two different occasions, he attempted to do away with himself. Evidently, Randy figured if he didn't die, he would have at least gotten Lynn's attention. But by 1999, it was all just too much for him. This same year, he finally moved out of the house and the pair separated. Despite this, Randy and Lynn still saw each other periodically over the next couple of years. Many of these meetings were romantic, and so Randy was optimistic that at some undetermined point in the future, he and Lynn would get back together. And before long, that really did seem like a strong possibility. On January 19th of 2001, Lynn agreed to meet with Randy in an effort to work out their differences. If not for them necessarily, then for the sake of their two young kids. The meeting took place at a restaurant and the couple had dinner together. But strangely enough, following this little rendezvous, something unexpected happened to Randy. Practically right after dinner, he became ill and started experiencing many of the same flu-like symptoms Glenn did. He couldn't get any food or water down. He felt dizzy and nauseous and he had an intense headache. Quickly, this led to him being hospitalized, but he was then released after given antibiotics and fluids. As Randy returned home, though, his condition worsened. Not only was he vomiting heavily, but he began experiencing severe breathing issues. In essence, his body was shutting down. One night on January 21st, Randy's firefighter friend, Paul, came over to see how he was doing. As Paul entered the home, he saw a bunch of overturned furniture and immediately knew something was up. Once he came face to face with Randy, Randy looked absolutely terrible. He was sweaty, pale, and he had lost a lot of water weight, and on top of that, he was acting very nervously. Randy apparently asked Paul, do you think I'm going to die? So obviously, at this point, he realized how sick he was. But once Paul left and Randy went to sleep, he never woke up in the morning. The next day, another firefighter friend by the name of Barry went over to Randy's house to check on him. Inside, he found Randy lying dead on his couch with a blanket pulled over him, practically the same exact way that Glenn Turner Lynn's previous partner had been found. And also, just like Glenn, Randy's shallow autopsy results determined his cause of death to be an irregular heartbeat. One difference in Randy's case, however, is that about a year before his death, he developed a staph infection after having sinus surgery. Additionally, his arteries were found to be quite clogged, meaning it was a bit easier to explain Randy's mysterious death than it was Glenn's. And so for a period of time, Randy's family just accepted it, grieved, and moved on. But within a matter of time, somebody got word of Randy's death who refused to accept it as being just a coincidence. Her name was Kathy Turner, Glenn Turner's mother. 
Before long, Kathy had sent Randy's mother, Nita, a letter discussing the similarities between what happened to her son and to Randy. Afterwards, the two of them got together a few times in real life and went over the exact details of each of their son's untimely deaths. Most of this info we've already talked about, but it's helpful to reiterate. Both Glenn and Randy suddenly became ill with intense flu-like symptoms. Both Glenn and Randy were hospitalized and sent home prematurely. Both Glenn and Randy were found to have had jello in their systems before dying. Both Glenn and Randy were found dead with blankets pulled around them. On top of this, it's important to mention that they were both courted romantically in the same way and that Lynn was so insistent on becoming the beneficiary of both of their pension and life insurance policies. Ironically for Lynn, however, once Randy passed away, she didn't end up receiving the amount of money she thought. This is because Randy, evidently, stopped paying for his life insurance premium several months before his death. But as we've hinted at, this was not going to be the only bad news Lynn was about to receive. Following their series of discussions, Kathy Turner and Nita Thompson led the charge to re-examine both of their son's mysterious deaths. In June of 2001, a second autopsy on Randy Thompson's body discovered calcium oxalate crystals in his tissue. What is calcium oxalate, you may ask? Well, that's just a fancy word for a type of kidney stone. But not only that, it's also a telltale sign of ethylene glycol poisoning, aka antifreeze. So as it turns out, Randy was poisoned. A month later in June, another autopsy was done on Glenn's body, and he too was found to have been poisoned with antifreeze. In other words, both Glenn and Randy were murdered. Soon, the official report for both causes of death were changed from natural causes to homicide. And of course, the cases were reopened. The following year, in November of 2002, Lynn Turner was officially charged with the murder of her ex-husband, Glenn. Then, almost two years later, in October of 2004, Lynn was indicted and charged with Randy Thompson's murder as well. For both murders, Lynn was ultimately given a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Regardless, she never even ended up serving half a decade. On August 30th of 2010, at 6.55 a.m., Lynn was found unresponsive in her cell after an overdose of prescription blood pressure medication. Forty minutes later, she was officially pronounced dead, and it's still unclear whether this was intentional or not. But wow, this case was a wild one. A lot of people might be wondering exactly how Lynn was able to poison her partners. Well, the answer is simple. The antifreeze she used was put into things like jello, soups, and tea. Over a period of a few days, Lynn would feed these things to her partners, and naturally, they would continue to get sicker and sicker. Because of the fact that antifreeze is a colorless, odorless, and sweet compound, it was practically impossible for them to detect it while eating. In response to her preferred method of murder, some in the media dubbed Lynn as the Black Widow, which for the few that don't understand is a reference to a poisonous spider. But what Lynn did to Glenn and Randy was absolutely terrible. Both of them worked on behalf of their communities and were dedicated to helping others. And while they were certainly flawed, as we all are, neither deserved to die in the way that they did. Rest in peace to Glenn Turner and Randy Thompson. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. Another thing is that recently I started an all-exclusive Patreon. Here, you're given the choice of three tiers, and the last one allows for a Patreon-only video that's uncensored. That and the second tier allow you to have your name 
at the end of each high time crime video. This is just in case you want to support me a little further. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.